Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our um, February Student Council Advisory Meeting. Uh, we've got a busy agenda for you today, so some important things to cover. Um, we'll uh, uh, here it is. Uh, Tony's got it up for us. So we got Heather on to um, cover a mindful minute with us. Uh, Tony's going to do a, a breakout activity on how students consume social media, so we're interested in that. Uh, we'll look at updates. Uh, from the February Board of Education meeting, uh, talk about the next student member of the Kentucky Board of Education. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our future projects. Uh, we have a legislative update with myself and Brian Perry, and then we've got uh, other communications opportunities with Tony. So that's what our agenda looks like. We may have to shuffle that just a little bit. I have an appointment to get to right at, um, let's see, uh, right at 11 o'clock. So I'll need to jet out just before that. So we may need to move a couple of things around, but that's what uh, it looks like so far. So maybe we could start with our roll call. Um, Tony, you want to run this through that? Yeah, I will run us through it. And I'm just going to go, it's just easier for us for record keeping purposes. I'm going to go ahead and just say your name and just please respond here or um, allow, just it's easier really if you could just verbalize that or um, at least message in the chat. Um, Gavin Bruning, Charlie Browning, Hunter Combs, here, Jude Dela, here, right, Delady Darty, Arnav Darmagata, Justin Denning, here, okay. Rayma Dutt, here. Ollie Fagenbush, Peter M. Jefferson. Here. All right. Nyla Johnson. Shraman Carr. All right. VJ. Here. All right. That I saw you there. Lauren Little. Here. Ella. Looking. Okay. Okay, I do not hear Ella, so I'll go back. Callie Alblonder. Here. Anastasia Panaretos. I'm here. Bandana Pavlori. Here. Alexandra Perry. Here. Panvi Rakish. Here. Chloe Ralston. Sophia Rit. Oh, Chloe is here. Good. Sophia Ritone. Here. Amy Rablero Perez. Luke Taylor. Here. Mally Taylor. Here. Sarah Umbarger. Bentley White. Here. Right. And Sarah Yu. All right, so if the other ones come on and, and uh, after I've called roll, I'll go back and check, but we have a full uh, full roll and a full roster. The next thing I wanted to do is just quickly uh, bring up the summary from the last minute, from the last meeting. You all should have those in your email if somebody would like to go through that or at least uh, offer me a motion so we can get those approved. I can make a motion. Okay, and who is this? Jude. All right, Jude is making the motion. Do I have a second? A second. Okay. All in favor? Anybody opposed? All right, sounds like we have no opposition. So uh, seconded by our opened, our, made a motion by Jude, seconded by Bentley, and all are in favor. We can move on to the next item on the agenda, which is um, Heather Bushelman. Heather, are you on? Yes, I'm here. All right. Okay. Good morning. Thank you all for having me. Um, I'm in Shelbyville today. So if you hear a little bit of feedback, <laughs> there's a lot of people in other rooms around me. So sorry about that. Um, so I'm excited to be here as always. Um, this is one of the highlights um, that I get to see students um, every month. And um, so today's activity is going to be pretty quick, um, but you do need something to write with or paper, a post-it. Um, if you have your phone, you can type in 
maybe the notes app um, or if you don't have any of that that's okay you can try to keep it all in your head <laughs> for what we're going to do um, so what i'd like for you to do first is we're going to take one minute and i want you to make a list of every activity assignment um, goal anything you have to complete between today and you can go all the way till friday okay so let's take one minute and just start writing down everything you need to complete between now and friday for home school extracurriculars okay all right so take one minute and go ahead and do that Yes, Bentley, <laughs> about 30 more seconds. All right, 10 seconds. OK, all right, so I'm sure you didn't get everything listed for the next three and a half days. Um, but of that list, whether you it's in your head, you wrote it down, whichever you were able to do this morning, um, I want you to think about the big rocks. Think about of your list. What are the absolute biggest um, deadlines, assignments, um, whatever you have to accomplish within the next few days. Um, and if you did write those down, um, if you can circle them, highlight them somehow out of the big list that you just wrote down. OK. So the reason why I wanted you to highlight some of the bigger um, deadlines, assignments, things that are happening is because typically this is a time of year when um, adults and actually high schoolers and middle schoolers, they start to get very overwhelmed. Um, March 1st is tomorrow. Um, spring break is coming in a few weeks, but this is kind of the time of year in our school year where there's not a lot of breaks. And so even our adults start to struggle just a little bit and our students really do as well. Um, just because you're not really having a day to maybe shut down, go do fun activities. Um, and for a lot of you, you know, the next two and a half months, um, you know, you are about to have a major life change. Um, so we wanted to think about today when we listed those items that you were able to do in one minute, it wasn't a lot of time, and you chose your biggest rocks. Out of those big rocks, are you feeling overwhelmed? Do you feel um, like it's very stressful? Do you feel anxious? Um, so feel free to put in the chat or you can even share out. Um, how many of you are feeling a little bit overwhelmed <laughs> with just what you wrote down for just this week? I see some hands, some head nods. <laughs> That's for the adults too. <laughs> I know I'm there, yes. OK, all right. Thank you all for sharing. Um, and for some of you, this week may be great where you feel like you are above water and you're doing awesome and you've got everything together and the next week everything may hit. Um, but the reason I want to bring this to your attention is because feeling overwhelmed at this time of year especially could potentially lead to some burnout. Um, so becoming self-aware about, um, do you feel yourself becoming more anxious? Um, do you feel a little bit sluggish more times than you're used to? Um, do you feel more irritable? Maybe you are snapping at people quicker. Um, 
things irritate you that normally do not. Um, and sometimes you don't know why. And so to think about those things you just listed this week, next week, you know, whenever it's happening, um, we want to be self-aware of, am I starting to feel overwhelmed? And physically, I am showing it, whether it's becoming more drowsy, it's becoming more irritable. It could even be some things you typically enjoy doing. You kind of feel like it's a chore to do some of those things now, just because of how overwhelmed you might feel. That's when it starts leading to burnout which means that becomes serious because you feel like you want to quit certain things or you don't want to go through with certain goals and accomplishments. And especially for you all and how much you have got to do and how much you model for other students, I think it's very important to not be so overwhelmed with everything you're involved in because it is important. And obviously you have amazing skills and talents to do those things. So as we circled those big rocks, Thinking about those as your biggest accomplishments this week, and then everything else beyond that is a smaller um, deadline or accomplishment to deal with. And sometimes those smaller things are what gets in the way of us enjoying the bigger tasks. So, for example, you may have a ball game, you may have a performance, you may have a, uh, an assessment that is part of that big rock category. But all these little things start trickling in like chores, practices maybe having to drive somebody here or there, um, maybe a quiz at school, maybe some little assignments, and that's what bogs us down. So always keep in mind what drives you. And when we think about those bigger accomplishments, how do you break those down? So you don't want to focus on this huge assessment, but breaking it down small every single day can help you to stay proactive and not feel so overwhelmed. Um, and like I said, truly being self-aware of your body and what you're feeling. And then those coping skills we've talked about, I know before, what works for you? Because if you feel overwhelmed and you try to keep um, doing your work, practicing your extracurricular activities, um, it, it probably will not go well. <laughs> so what do you do to take a break? So think about right now when you feel overwhelmed and you start to lose focus, um, share in the chat um, or you can unmute. What are some things you have found that works for you to take a step back? even if it's for three minutes. Um, so I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. It looks like Callie has her hand up, I think. Callie? Or not? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like there's some in the chat, Tony. Let's mm -hmm. see. I'm trying to look at it. Um, looks like, oh, there's walks, music. There's another music. Um, taking a walk. Wow. It's, 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 it's interesting how some of you are, have very purposeful, um, co coping skills. It's not just, I breathe which I truly appreciate because I think a lot of times when we think about coping skills, we say, breathe for 10 seconds, do your nose and your mouth. And so you are very purposeful in how you're listening to your music, journaling, yoga, Netflix. <laughs> yes, Bentley, TV is mine. <laughs> I feel you on that. Um, okay. Going to the gym. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for sharing. Um, so as you go for the next few months, um, always keep that in mind, um, just because if you have weeks like it is, I'm sure for a lot of you this week, um, that's overwhelming, it's stressful. You don't ever want to get into that stage of burnout because I know some of us are so overly involved and we enjoy it and it's great. Um, but you've got to take care of yourself first to like you, like you all just put to step back, take a few minutes to keep focused because otherwise your work is not going to be 
at the par you want it to be and your extracurriculars will not do what you want them to do and and then you'll feel disappointed which leads to more stress if <laughs> we don't want that um, so just keep that in mind as you all work the next few months and you've got some big things happening um, and, and of course I'll you know you are a model for your peers as well because you see your peers at school you know struggling with being overwhelmed overly involved um, so even if you notice mood changes with them or behavior changes that could be something that's happening with them that they may not realize is they have too much going on and they can't figure out how to make smaller steps to get to those big rocks and they're letting all those smaller things bog them down um so okay um well as always i've enjoyed being here with you all um are there any questions or anything else before you all continue All right. Okay. Well, thank you as always for letting me join you. I appreciate your feedback as always. Um, and just let me know if you need anything moving forward. So. All right. Okay. Thank you so thank much, you. Heather. We appreciate you being here and taking the chance to, to talk with our kids. All right. So our next item on the agenda is I'm actually going to introduce um, it's it's a communications roundtable. I mean, and, and you all many of you all know Audrey Lamb and Caleb Bates um, with my team here at the Department of Ed, and they are going to participate in an activity with you um, at a communications roundtable. So let me go ahead and share their slides. And I think Audrey is kicking off, but uh, take it away, guys. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to join you all today um, in front of you all. Uh, normally, I'm behind the scenes helping you all, so it's it's uh, an honor to present to you all. So the way this started, and I'm going to just be really quick and uh, jump into this um, so we have time to talk, is that um, I'm sure you guys are aware that Gen Z, our generation, so your current generation, um, it's um, people aged from 11 to 26 are very different from previous generations in the fact that technology rapidly developed while we were young. We were exposed to technology at a very young age, exposed to social media at a very young age, um, and it has shaped who we are as people and um, is kind of an integral part of us. And so I just felt um, with Caleb and Tony and Glyptus Ann that we would love to just kind of get your feedback on how we do communication here at the department. And I just kind of put this graph up here because I was doing some research about teens and so some social media usage. Um, and I just thought this was interesting to show you all before we get started with our conversation. Um, about social media usage and how it's changed very quickly over the years, like um, from 2015 to now in 2023. Um, so hopefully uh, we will, Tony, are you able to split them up into groups, breakout rooms? I don't know if I have that ability. I think I can, but I've got to, it might take a minute. So okay. I might just have to randomly do that. It might be quicker to do it that way. Yeah, that works. Um, but um, just so you all know, I know that not everybody uses social media. So we also have some other questions on there just about news stories and Kentucky Teacher, which is our online publication. Um, and basically just trying to get a full scope. And then also one of the things we want to do this year is redesign the Commissioner Student Advisory Council logo. So we'll try to get y'all's thoughts on that. If you're not sure what it is, it's currently the profile photo of the Twitter. Let me drop it in the chat real quick. And Caleb, do you have anything you want to say before we do our breakout rooms? Um, nothing really comes to mind, Audrey. I'm uh, very excited to, uh, to break out and uh, have some good conversation. All right, so the only problem is is I may have to, if for some reason Caleb and you and Audrey end up in the same room, I may have to physically move you if that happens for some reason. And then I think for um, just for our viewing audience, I'm not sure, do we would just want to stay with one breakout group or do we want to put a slide that just says we're in breakouts? Um, what do you what do you prefer? We can stay with one breakout room. That's fine. Okay, that sounds good because I think we have some that are joining us um, 
Yeah, that'll work. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to try to do it. it. Might take just a just a minute or so. All right, it says the rooms are opening, so everybody should start uh, like the little Harry Potter hat should be going over. Um, and Bentley, I'll make sure that um, you're that you are in the right room with the translation as well. I apologize. Up a session uh, with a couple of uh, people from the communications team where we were doing a roundtable and breakouts, um, and we were asking students. These are the questions that we asked everyone, or we were getting around to. Um, and these are going to be additional items that you can share feedback with us um, as uh, part of your exit slip or uh, feedback back to us after the meeting is over with. Um, Caleb and, and Audrey, did you all want to close us out? Um, yeah, so I just want to say thank you all um, for speaking to us about this. Um, and giving us your feedback. Um, I know in my group, we were kind of finishing the conversation on, um, you know, a lot of stuff that's happening in the news or being reported on, you know, affects you all directly um, as students, um, whether it's United We Learn, whether it's initiative the Department of Education do it, is doing, whether it's legislation. So I think it's really important for us to take a step back and ask you all how you like to stay informed and, um, so thank you all for participating and enlightening us. And I hope that, you know, with this feedback, we'll be able to better serve you all because we're here for you. Um, so if there's anything I can do for you all, Caleb can do for you all as the Division of Communications. I just want to put this offer out there. We've done this offer before um, about if you ever want to um, spotlight something on social media that your school is doing, like an event you're really proud of. Um, or um, you want to speak out um, on Kentucky Teacher, like I know Jude has spoken out about the importance of student voice and why that matters in schools. Um, we'd love to have you participate. So those are all of our social media channels that you can find us on. So thank you all. all right. All right, thank you. Um, and then touching, uh, getting back to the agenda, Dr. Glass and Jude. Yeah, thanks, Tony. And uh, I asked uh, Meredith Brewer to also weigh in on this to just update folks on the um, board meeting from February. Of course, Jude is our student representative on the Board of Education, Kentucky Board of Education. So I'll ask uh, Meredith and Jude to walk through the um, agenda, what, what things the board talked about, and, and Jude, some of your experiences. Dude, you go ahead and kick us off. OK, um, I have my phone and like notes, so just like things I want to hit on. Um, first things first. Um, so the US Senate Youth Program, we have our Kentucky students picked out and selected. And those are that's Heng Yang from Boone County and then also David Daniel from Owensboro, Owensboro Independent. So I thought that was just very cool because I actually know Hang personally, and that was just like a really great achievement. So I'm very proud um, on that. Um, also at the meeting, Breathitt County was released from state assistance. So they are finally on their own, which that was a very, very great um, achievement and accomplishment. Everyone was very happy during that meeting. Um, on the more like t technical side, um, most of the meeting on the first day on the 7th um, was just talking about accountability systems and then we also got updates from advanced kentucky and we also did hear from our teacher of the year um Ms. Perez. she is on the call with us right now so that was really great um last meeting we actually heard from her um this council but now she actually went to the board and um gave a similar presentation and if you guys remember um her like initiative and what she wanted to achieve with um, like the makerspace and those types of things and our recommendations. So she brought that to the board and shared that. So that was really great seeing that come full circle. Um, and then lastly, on my end, um, I gave a presentation on school connectedness and behavior management. 
So that was something that I had been working on since, I want to say October, um, under the National Association of State Boards of Education. So I basically got to choose a health issue that I was passionate about in schools, and that was school connectedness and behavior management. So I got to give a data-driven presentation to the board members, and um, basically I chose a lot of um, data from like the Kentucky report card. And then I also took some student testimonies and those some students were on this board and some um, were from my school and others um, from different um, parts that I've reached out. But I actually got to share some student testimonies on behavior management and how um, situations were handled in schools. So that was really great. And currently I'm about to start contacting United We Learn and seeing if I could collaborate with them to further this project. And Jude did a fantastic job. She definitely made you all very proud. And uh, she has been a great representative for Kentucky in that student collaborative with NASB. In fact, when she went to the national conference, um, she is so well known for her work and, and passion in this area. She was asked to speak on a panel uh, with other student representatives. So you guys should be very proud. And later in the meeting, we'll talk about how we will select the new member, um, the new student member on the board. So we are very sad that Jude will be leaving us in early June, but um, or in early July, I should say, but we um, were thrilled with her presentation and the dialogue that came about from uh, her presentation. The board members had some great questions for her and gave her some good feedback on that. Um, as Jude mentioned, we did on the first day have some amendments to our accountability system that were proposed, but I think it's important for us to sort of distinguish that action from the work of United We Learn that we also talked about that day. So those amendments that were proposed were around um, how post-secondary readiness is determined at the schools, uh, for at our high schools in particular, with um, students who are engaged in an apprenticeship program uh, and how they are deemed career ready. Those changes that were proposed are needed to align with statute. However, we also are very excited about kind of the future of our accountability system and where we hope to move the state uh, through United We Learn. And so we had two different presentations. Uh, one was really just engaging in conversation around what different accountability systems we could consider. And then we had one uh, from KnowledgeWorks, which is an external partner that we work with um, that sort of walked through some different uh, possible paths that the board may consider um, in supporting kind of this evolution of our accountability system based upon the feedback from the United We Learn Council. So you will be hearing a lot about United We Learn in uh, the months ahead, and I'm sure you already are aware of uh, this initiative, um, but I do think it's important for us all to sort of keep in mind that that is the, a little bit longer term. So we're looking um, sort of several years ahead about how we want that accountability system to evolve, but we still have to remain in compliance with state and federal law in the meantime. So that's what those um, proposed amendments were um, about. So Dr. Glass, anything you wanna add on the February board meeting? It was uh, another great time for the board to get together and talk about important matters and do some important business. No, I don't think so. I think you all done a great job uh, covering it. Tony, anything else you want no. us to, to no, highlight? I, no, I think you all um, did a good job on that. Um, I think that's it. And then I think Meredith, you're the, you're up next for speaking of the board. Uh, she wanted to go over kind of our next steps on um, what we are looking for or in terms of, uh, well, I'll just let Meredith, you take it over. Okay. <laughs> it was discussion no, on the, um, it was discussion on the selection of our next student member. That's correct. So as I mentioned, um, the term for our non-voting student and teacher members is only one year. So that was a change that went into place um, in statute and our accompanying regulation. So the term is one year and the representing district changes each year as well. And so our new uh, student member will come from the fifth congressional district. I am um, somewhat nervous to share that we actually have not received any applications yet uh, for that position. However, as a 
uh, procrastinator, and I know there are others in the, the mix, the deadline is March 6th. That might as well be an eternity from now. So we are hopeful that everyone is working hard on their applications uh, and um, will be submitting those in time for the March 6th de deadline. Um, as I mentioned from the 5th Congressional District, there's a map that's on the screen right now uh, for you to kind of have an awareness of what counties are represented in the 5th District. For our teacher member, it's the 1st Congressional District. As I said, it will rotate. So March 6th is the deadline. And then the regulation um, around the selection of these members outlines kind of, um, yes, we will put the application in the chat, um, how this process sort of uh, moves through to the selection. So once the application closes, the department has three days to review those applicants, confirm eligibility, and then do the appropriate redaction to then send to the Student Advisory Council the applications for the student member and the teacher advisory council, the applications for the teacher member. And then a subset of those um, two committees will review and make a recommendation to the state board um, for the preferred candidate for uh, those roles. Last year, we had the same process and we actually have a few members who I believe are on the call who served on that special committee. So Delaney, Gavin, and Alexandra, would any of you like to sort of share about um, your time on that special committee that reviewed applications? And then I will conclude with my pitch to see who would like to serve on the committee this year. So would any of those people, or if there's anyone else on the call who served, I, I believe it was just those three that are still um, on the council. I just want to say that it was it was really fun doing it, just going through all of the applications. And then we had a discussion that was supposed to be an hour long. I think it went far past that. <laughs> and we were just debating every single application. We created a list of the top three, we broke it down. And it was just really uh, nice having a student voice to be able to choose the other student voice. So I'm hearing you saying is hanging out with me is just a really fun time. Um, I think was is what it was. So yes, we had a great debate. I was just facilitating. They asked me to weigh in. I will not weigh in on the on the candidates. So just to be aware, but um, they had a great conversation. Uh, we did have a student member serve as chair of the committee um, who has since graduated, but he did a fantastic job. Um, Gavin, Delaney, anything you want to share? It was absolutely fun, <laughs> but I will say that when you start, it seems like a lot to go through all the applications and you think you're never going to find the ones you like or nothing's going to stick out, but you get the three or four that really stick out to you and you fight for them, <laughs> even when no one agrees and you figure it out and it's really, really fun. Awesome. So I don't know if Gavin wants to add, but there was a memorable candidate that Gavin was just really committed to, and he was going to not back down. So he was he was fighting for his candidate. So just a couple uh, things that I want to clarify about the process. As I said, they are redacted, so you won't know the name of the um, applicant, um, their school. So all of that is uh, removed. So you really are looking at the merits of the application. Um, We'll put the application link in the chat, but just for you to be aware, it's a pretty substantial application, probably similar to Governor Scholars or certainly um, sort of a college application. Jude, Jude could speak to the actual process since she successfully navigated it, um, but you write a narrative, you have to secure um, parent support, um, school level support, you need to have letters of recommendation. So it's it's not an insignificant lift, um, but I think Jude would say that it's worth it. Hopefully she would say that, yes. And she wrote a great article um, trying to recruit applicants. Um, but as I said, so once we have our committee, I will send you all of those redacted applications. You'll review them with a rubric that I will provide, and then you sort of score, and then we'll have one meeting, a virtual meeting, where you'll go through and advocate for your candidates. And then we'll select um, the top uh, two or three to move on for the board to consider. So Jude, anything you wanna say about being the student member for those who may be uh, considering to apply? A uh, couple, one more thing before I pitch to Jude. Um, the candidate does need to be a current sophomore, so a rising junior. They need to be a junior um, the year that they serve. So Jude, anything you wanna say for those maybe considering applying? 
apply. Um, that's that's it. That's that's basically it. Um, it's such a great opportunity. Like you get to work with the best people all the time. Um, it's it's just so crazy to me. I was last year this time. I was figuring out like I was writing my narrative. I was getting my recommendations. I was getting everything together. But um, it's it's really been an amazing year and I'm sad my term is coming to an end but I'm very excited to see um, who will step up and Meredith just to ease um, your anxiety I didn't submit my application till like five minutes before it was due so hopefully we have students submitting it late um, but yeah so it's just it's such a great opportunity um, I, all I can do is encourage you to apply or if you know someone who fits, um, who is a sophomore, who's in the 5th Congressional District and who has all the qualifications, um, definitely reach out to them, see if they'll be interested. Um, yeah. That's basically awesome. it. Thanks, dude. Okay, so uh, we sort of have been talking about two separate things. So we have the application open currently uh, that closes on March 6th for the student members. So if you happen to be a current sophomore and you reside in the 5th Congressional District, apply. If you are watching at home and that is you, apply. The second issue is sort of who wants to serve on the selection committee. So there was a question in the chat. Um, we will determine once we have the list of the interested parties, what date works for everyone. It'll need to be the week of March 13th or the week of March 20th so that we have time to get those applications to the KBE special committee who will then review those recommendations. Um, as was mentioned, dependent upon the number of applicants, you know, you'll have a little bit of, of work to do before that meeting because you'll need to read the applications, score them with the rubric and get everything ready for that conversation that we'll have about the um, application review and recommended um, candidates. But all said and done, I would say three to five hours max of um, additional work. And I know as Heather had you work through, uh, your schedules are very full, but we would appreciate your consideration. So here's where I ask. If you would like to serve on this special committee, can you please let me know either by um, sending me an email or putting your name in the chat and then I will look through the chat and make sure I capture all of those names and then um, clip to San or Tony, we can send an email to the students. Uh, one last kind of call for anyone who maybe isn't on today to see if they're interested. Then I'll send out a doodle poll. We'll plan our meeting time and we will get you um, those applications by March 9th per the regulation. So any questions about this process? Meredith, it looks like there was a, there's a couple coming in there. there I don't know, want to miss it. Um, just a clarification, are the geographic requirements based on residency or school membership? So it is residency. So think about kind of where, what you would have for your voting. So it, where you would vote. So what is your congressional district? Yeah. And it looks like you have a lot of interest here. So I have, um, I'm writing down those names for you and we'll it's send so those out. And um, as, as Dr. Brewer mentioned, we'll um, definitely follow up with those of you. We have a lot of our students that are not able to attend the meeting today, um, but we'll follow back and watch the meeting back and give you guys a couple of days to determine whether you'd like to be on it or not. And then Dr. Brewer will be back in touch with you on that. Thanks everyone. All right. Up next is Dr. Glass. He is back um, to discuss, um, as you, as many of you all know, and I have to, again, really give everybody a shout out for their participate participation in the student safety project that we um, presented uh, to, uh, our, well, publicly last uh, last time we met, which was in January. Representative Tipton was here and you all um, had quite a media um, representation here for that. Um, I will say that I do think that that um, was a really wonderful showing from our media 
and that I think it's the most media I've ever had here at one time. <laughs> and that includes test score time, which is usually a very, very busy time for us. So I was really, really happy to see um, our state media, our local media pick that story up and continue to tell the story. Um, I know I'm working with a reporter right now in Eastern Kentucky that's looking to connect with um, one of the students who participated in that project. And so I'm working to connect that reporter with you and then also Dr. Glass. Um, but then Dr. Glass, I know, had a little side conversation while some people were meeting with Dr. Brewer before they presented. And so I just wanted to kick off this opportunity uh, to him to discuss maybe what, what might be next uh, in terms of project. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Uh, I think you've summed it up well. We uh, really appreciated it and, and I think got some good traction on the student safety um, brief and work that you did, and we're wondering around what sort of the next step. Um, the student safety um, focus really came about in the wake of the Uvalde shooting. So we had a meeting of this group right after the Uvalde shooting, and uh, there was sort of a, um, a groundswell of support around wanting to do something around that to say, here's the student perspective or student voice on on the issue of, of school safety. Um, and so we're wondering sort of what's next. Um, at our last meeting, we did have a discussion around um, how students are weighing the decisions around the next step in uh, your life. So this is a really important transitional phase that you're in. <clears throat> Certainly you're living in and, and, and enjoying and experiencing high school right now, but then there's this, this really pivotal transition point. And so we were talking about what are some of the factors that you use to weigh, are you going into college or where that is, or are you going into work, are you going into the military, um, is there some other uh, future trajectory, what are some of the influences around that, um, and how do you how do you weigh or evaluate those? So that, that was one discussion that we had for a possible future uh, topic, but I don't want to um, imprint on uh, on this group what it is you you want to focus on. Um, so I think what I'd like to do is kind of do three steps. One is ideation, a second is discussion, and a third is decision. Um, so um, we can start with the ideation. So I've sort of put one out there and that's, you know, do you wanna have uh, a, the, the work ahead be focused on that, that transition and what things students should be considering as uh, they make that transition. I did run that by the um, the student council presidents from the universities. Uh, so these were these are the people that are uh, presidents of student organizations at uh, the colleges and universities in the state. Um, and they were excited about that that topic. But again, it's not something that you have to do. If there's something else that's more pressing or more interesting that the group has, then, then that should be elevated as well. Uh, but that's one that's out there. Um, Meredith, anything you want to weigh in on, on at this point, just as the person that's facilitated the group on the student safety uh, effort um, for next steps? Sure. So I think it's important to sort of think about why we do research and sort of develop these sort of documents. And there are kind of different purposes dependent upon sort of identified goals. So sometimes we research things um, because we have a question and we're curious and want to kind of learn more about it. Sometimes we research because there's a problem that we've identified that we want to make recommendations for how to address it. And that certainly is the category that the policy brief falls under. Um, we knew of a concern, and so we were trying to think through what could be done to address it. And kind of the third category for research is sort of that you want to contribute in some sort of meaningful way um, to the existing sort of literature or discussions around this topic, which really sort of fits into what Dr. Glass has proposed. Sort of there's this um, topic about kind of transitions uh, into sort of next next academic journeys. So um, I think we just sort of need to identify what it is that you're wanting to accomplish with this project. And I think the other thing that uh, we need to uh, always keep in mind is sort of the audience, right? So who are we hoping uh, will receive uh, this information? And, and that helps us sort of think through how we want to um, design the project. Okay, so I think let's um, open it up now for uh, the first, first phase is ideation. 
So what ideas are out there? And and at this point, there aren't any bad ideas. So uh, just topics that that folks are interested in. And so we've talked about one, and that being um, this um, sort of uh, weighing the transition uh, or considerations for the transition um, to uh, from high school to the next phase in life as as one possible topic. But let's um, ideate on on others. Are you meaning completely new ideas or all uh, ideas kind of linked towards the student safety initiate uh, initiative that we just worked on? I think it could. The floor is open uh, for new ideas, so um, you could go deeper on the student safety issue if there's uh, or school safety issue if there's uh, other work that you want to do around that. So you could stay on that topic. Um, this the other one that we've introduced is this uh, idea of around transition. <clears throat> um, Bentley is sort of uh, wondering about the uh, what students consider for transition, so that's building on that. So we've got um, maybe a couple of ideas that are out there, but just anything that you're interested in. Uh, really, the we're we're giving you the ability now to decide what it is you want to um, work on as a group. What is what is it that you want to have a student voice or statement about? Students, if this helps at all, just think about, you know, when when we ask mm -hmm. in the group me, like, what are some of the things you're interested in? You know, usually you guys provide a lot of really good feedback on that. And so just think of it as something that, you know, perhaps we you can do a project um, or some kind of research based on uh, something that might be um, you know, you've asked for smaller, you know, just to have on an agenda as an agenda item. What would you like to hear more of and learn more about? So Chloe has her hand up. Go ahead, Chloe. Hey, so I was there for the conversation last time in the in-person meeting where we talked a little bit about the transition idea, and that was something I really liked when I left there. I thought about it a little bit. I feel like it's important to help with the navigation of the future, especially for our students with either post-secondary education or what career field they're going to go into. And I think a big issue is students don't really know what opportunities they have when deciding a job what's out there what we can do and i think that's something that might help to kind of bring that up and start talking about that <clears throat> great thank you so there's a uh, some support around that and then there's been a couple of more ideas put in here um, effects of early college programs uh, on students and staff at high schools from luke and uh, bentley has the effects of ap or dual credit courses uh, so it's sort of related to what Luke's talking about, I think. Um, why don't uh, Luke, why don't you come on and talk some about your idea and uh, tell us about that. And uh, then uh, also, Bentley, let's have you uh, discuss yours. But Luke, uh, first you. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm the student representative for my school's site-based decision-making council. And so we've been having a huge difficulty with not enough staffing and too many students. I think we're at like 108% capacity. And we've been having to turn down uh, transfer students. We're a public high school, we're not a magnet high school or anything like that. Uh, but basically we have 1800 students. So we usually only have 1300 students on campus because we send so many uh, to the uh, community college down the road. And so that's really taken away a lot of our uh, big student leaders. And so our school culture has kind of been damaged by that. Like you have, um, we have a lot of AP classes. So we kind of separate everybody based upon if you're early college AP or just kind of like regular college preparatory classes. And so you're basically left with the college preparatory and then like 20 AP students while you have like 100 really strong leaders at the early college that don't ever have to step foot onto a high school during their day. And while I do agree that like getting an associate's degree while they're in high school is an awesome opportunity, it really has damaged our school culture. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Luke. Uh, appreciate that. And 
Uh, Bentley, you also had uh, something related to this. Um, so I, I, you want to talk about that if, you know, based on what Luke said, or do you really have sort of the same idea or is there something a little different here? I was kind of thinking more of a like statistical thing of how when students take advanced placement or dual credit courses, does that really have a clear impact on college success or is it just more of a just simply just an advanced class that student has taken schooling? I'm wondering if it is there any like statistical evidence that it improves your post-secondary education career. Mm -hmm. It's related to some work that there's something that um, we have been doing in collaboration with the Council on Post-Secondary Education and the Lieutenant Governor called the Commonwealth Continuum, uh, which is all around getting more students into and through higher education experiences. And one of the major focus areas with that effort has been the increase in uh, trying to drive an increase in dual credit um, AP, any, any sort of early college credits, uh, because it uh, there is an association with students who have more of those are more likely to go to higher education and more likely to finish. Uh, so that, that association is there. But it sounds like you're interested in um, sort of um, mining that a little further and, and clarifying it. Are there any members on the council that serve on the continuum? Typically, there are a few student representatives. So Charlie um, does, okay. Charlie Browning does, and she's uh, taking an exam today, so she's Perfect. not with okay. us today. Got it. Okay. Okay. And uh, Justin's got another idea here, are the effects of COVID on students and how schools and teachers can adapt to those in the classroom. Justin, you want to come on and talk about that some? Justin, are you able to talk about that? See, he might be having, an, let me look and see if I can. Here we go. Okay, I'm I was here. gonna say, I could see you there trying to mute or unmute. I don't know if that was a problem on our end or, or whatnot, but go ahead. Um. On the screen here in a second too. So I know that y'all did a lot of work like before I joined the council with mental health and COVID, but um, kind of my my thought on that was you know education itself. Like students are learning in different ways, and like behavior is going is you know changing too. Especially I've noticed it in my school. Like students are coming to high school a lot less mature than they were you know years ago before COVID happened. And um, students aren't learning the same way either. Like, there's no more the lectures kind of style teaching and um, that kind of, you know, here's the information, now hold it, and then we'll try to use it. It just it just doesn't seem to be working and, like, grasping student attention anymore. And so that's that's kind of, that's the, the way that I was thinking when I posed that idea was, not so much the mental health because I know there's been good work done on that by this council, but the the actual like true education of that um, after COVID on students. Great, thanks, Justin. So I think we've got um, kind of three really interesting ideas here. Um, one is around so far we've got this uh, transition uh, question or what are the factors that students. Um, way when making the decisions around the next this next chapter in your life. A second is um, really what um, Luke and Bentley have been. Uh, I think both uh, pu pushing on is is this concept of uh, early college dual credit AP. What's the association with that? Is that a good thing for the ex both the experience of students in high school and and the high school culture along with what's the longer uh, and really Bentley's addition to that is what's the longer range impact on that uh, uh, do we see an association with um, later outcomes uh, associated with that uh, and then Justin's got this really interesting question around what have been the effects of 
um, uh, the COVID experience on uh, student mental health. There's certainly a lot of research around that going on right now um, and a, a lot that we don't know, but it's something that we're working through and trying to find out right now. So um, I, I think in, in all of these, what we would be wanting from this group pi primarily is what is your experience or what is what is your perspective on it? Um, so, uh, you know, we, we don't necessarily need to conduct uh, research um, similar to what uh, professional researchers might doing. What I think it would be really interesting is what is the student experience, and that's really the the purpose of this council is to bring your lived experiences, your perspective on these questions uh, forward. Um, so um, let's see if there's any other ideas that have come in. I think Mally. Oh yeah, I I do. I have something to add kind of uh, with what uh, Bentley and Luke were saying. Um, I think one idea that I had before, um, like they mentioned, AP and dual credit courses uh, was talking about education disparities specifically in Kentucky, um, like related, not just like in, or, like in Kentucky, but like Kentucky related to other states. Um, but some, I, I have a sociology course. Um, and seeing the difference, the differences in like education in Kentucky compared to like um, like other other bigger states, I think that linking um, the idea with AP and dual credit courses to um, what has like historically been, you know, uh, how do we people say Kentucky's, you know, behind in uh, in catching up, but um, like kind of linking that to uh, the AP and dual credit and how that can how that can kind of push us forward, um, if that makes sense. Sorry, I don't really know how to like put it. So a couple of things that are important to think about, as Dr. Glass mentioned, you know, there already is a body of of research on um, a lot of these topics, particularly around kind of the value of post-secondary exposure within secondary programs. Um, but I think that there's a unique contribution that this group can make, similar to what happened with the policy brief, where you can help to contextualize some of what has already emerged in the literature, sort of put it within, you know, a Kentucky specific context. And you can speak to your personal experiences and those of your peers and kind of help to uh, round out you know, here's what the literature says, here's what, what we assume to be true, but here's how it's playing out um, in our actual educational experience. The one caveat on that, though, that's always important is that research, when designed well, um, controls for all of these different variables so that we can feel confident in the validity of what is sort of being proposed. And we have to be careful to not uh, fall sort of, you know, be trapped by this sort of um, N of one, right, this sort of unique experience, which isn't really representative of the larger phenomena. So we have to, um, you know, use our anecdotes and use our personal experiences in the right way so that we're sort of helping to provide more depth to a topic and not just like, you know, this was my experience. So then that negates kind of this larger body um, of research. So, I think, as Dr. Glass said, if you want to talk about sort of transitions, you know, talking about um, the experiences that you've had with some of these courses, do you feel like it's prepared you for a future path appropriately, or was it really, as Bentley said, just a high value course that was sort of um, more academically rigorous? Uh, than some of the other courses that were offered, some of those sorts of things. And then you could even talk to former members of the Student Advisory Council and sort of have them weigh in from the other side now that they've transitioned to um, their sort of post-secondary uh, next step. So I think that that we just want to keep in mind that when we do use research, we look and sort of see what has sort of been shown to be true, and then we apply it within um, the particular setting that we're trying to learn more about. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so I think we've got three ideas that have sort of emerged so far, and I'm trying to synthesize as we go. Um, so the first is sort of factors and considerations around post high school transition. A second is around early college programs, AP dual credit and perspectives on that, both for the high school experience and also beyond. 
And third is the effects of COVID restrictions on student mental health and academics. Um, so those are the three big ideas that I've heard so far. Uh, have I missed anything or are there any other ideas that we want to consider at this point? And then what I'm going to do next is um, if we if we think we understand uh, these and perhaps another uh, idea or two that's out there, uh, I'm going to have you rate them, rank them in terms of your interest. So were there other other concepts or have I captured it well? Uh, and, and if I haven't, uh, please pipe up and and let me know if there's there's something else uh, in this or uh, there's another idea out there. So can I propose a wild card while others are thinking? Um, it seems like, at least from, from my perspective, that the emphasis on student voice is really taking root in Kentucky. And it may be interesting to sort of look at where student voice has been elevated, has that actually brought about any particular proposed changes? So have we seen the actual impact in um, sort of education policy related to the influence of student voice? So I, I don't know, Jude is our student voice advocate here who just wrote an article. <clears throat> so maybe Jude would like to speak to sort of, um, and I know all of you um, are very interested in sort of how student voice is being uh, responded to within the K-12 setting. Yeah, so first I just wanna say, I love all of the ideas. Um, I was just like thinking, deeply into all of them and like how um we can utilize student voice to present them um so i guess my question specifically on these topics um and this can go i don't know who exactly i'm asking the question to whether it's us as the students or um like meredith and um, dr glass but do we want this to be like another policy brief, another one pager, like is that what we're aiming for when we choose our project topic or is this something more of um, what's something we want to just elevate um, by like advocating on? So like that's 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 my main question. And from there, I think we could get more clarification on how um, to like target what project we want to hit on. Yeah, probably both. Um... Jude, um, so I think um, you would want to make, you know, come together, and this may be a project that we work on for the next, uh, you know, six months or a year, um, is what are, what are the, what's the student perspective and recommendations around any of these topical areas, um, and then coupling with, coupled with that, what is some advocacy that you could do? So I think probably both of those things. Okay, and with that, please correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but would we able would we be able to speak on, I think it's House Bill 161, which is um, promoting getting students on um, boards. I think that's the right number, it might not be, but to students, would you guys be interested on working specifically on that and advocating for student positions on um, boards? Because then that kind of hits on, um, students within policy making but then it also that's a way for us to get more engaged um, within our districts where we can speak on our own problems because i know um, when talking about like early college programs that depends on the schools and, and where you are and the resources that you have so like whether that's good or bad is depending on the situation so i think that would be something that we could do um, if you have any feedback yeah that that's just an idea Yeah, I think that's Representative Timoney and uh, Bojanowski's bill. Um, the um, <clears throat> the timing on uh, that, I mean, the legislative session is going to be over in a month. Um, so I think if uh, there's probably strong interest among this group of, of being supportive of that legislation. So uh, I think you can do that now. Um, and then, you know, going forward, if there's interest in continuing the work around how student voice can be impactful in state and local policy decisions. That could be the, the work that you do um, as a group going forward. So I think we've got four really good ideas now. Um, and I just want to pause here and see if there's any questions. I, I want to uh, put us sort of uh, try to summarize them real quickly. 
Uh, I'll put that in the chat here. The four ideas, post high school transition, early college programs, effects of COVID restrictions, and student voice. So those are the four kind of ideas that I've heard. Um, if there's uh, something that uh, I've missed or if there's another idea out there, I, I think speak now. And I think really any of these are really good areas for uh, the for you for student voice to be lifted up in. OK, not hearing any any more ideas. Uh, how I think we can proceed is uh, Tony's has an exit slip that she uh, does at the end of the meeting. And so what we'll ask you to do is to uh, rank order these in terms of which ones you're most interested in. And then we'll uh, at uh, following the meeting, we'll uh, provide you the results of that uh, rank ordering. And that will um, allow us to focus on what uh, the next uh, area of, of focus for this group will be in terms of that policy work. Um, does that work, Tony? Yes, I think that works fine. Um, I did want to just make sure we go over the, the timing of this as well. Um, just reminding you all that um, we are not going to, and I'll get to this at the end of the meeting too, just as a reminder, is that we will not have a meeting in March for the student advisory. Uh, the way that the meetings worked out with the April meeting, it was only about two weeks uh, time. And so the next meeting that we will have is in <clears throat> April, and it'll be an in-person meeting. So I know that the last time we did this project, we kind of started it over the summer and kind of had some issues with a lot of students participating and uh, governor scholars or arts school for the arts. We will also have um, additional student advisory members joining us. I think we'll have about 18 or 19. Uh, we have a large senior class this year. So I just wanted to put that out there as a as a just to let students know when when we would foresee this starting and um, would we want to have an item on the agenda at the next meeting to discuss further? You know, what are your thoughts on that? That's for anybody, really. <laughs> Dr. Glass or Meredith, I don't know. If you guys were envisioning maybe starting this like with the new advisory that start, I mean, we could certainly start, you know, talking about it because they'll be um, continuing on. But, you know, our first advisory meeting for the next year will be in August. Uh, and ideally, we'll bring them uh, into the building probably in September for their first, you know, in-person meeting. I know those tend to be a little bit um, better for like group work. So um, just, you know, I guess having I, I don't know if the students want to weigh in and what their thoughts are seeing as though we just went through this process this last year and what maybe worked and what didn't um, so that we can just kind of build this to be successful for the next uh, next year. So if the students are able to identify a topic during the April meeting, so if we want to have some discussion and sort of honing our research questions, so the topics that you've identified are huge, so then we need to sort of think about specifically what you want to look into. We could then spend the spring and summer Reading, everyone's favorite thing, right? Doing research, thinking about what is already um, what has already been explored, and and like we did last year, right? We had a lot of time spent in um, sort of existing uh, policies and and looking at the literature, and then in the fall we really dug in and started writing. So um, that would sort of be one one possible. Um, cadence for this would be sort of, you know, thinking about the spring and summer is like we're all going to be doing our research and sharing what we've learned without any specific time set for any writing. We just are learning and then we dig in in the fall and start drafting. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the the um, goal right now is to really try to narrow down a topic. Uh, then I think we can start working through the logistics of how um, we work on that. How, how long it takes is however long it takes. Um, so, um, you know, this could be something that is quite extended and, and continues across different groups. And we'll have some continuity um, uh, with with this group, though some, some of our students will um, fall off. We'll have others that will come on and we'll have some that will continue through. So we'll have to think about how we onboard folks um, 
as part of that. So I think that's a logistical consideration. Um, at this point, um, let's let's focus on. Um, uh, do we have any other uh, topics that are out there? I, I, I'm not hearing any, but I'll pause just to see if there's anything else, or do these four um, strike enough interest that I think we're ready to move move ahead. Okay, not hearing anything else. I think, Tony, if you could put these four mm -hmm. uh, into the rank order uh, for the exit ticket, we'll let the students uh, vote on those or, or rank them. And then we'll let's let's get together, um, Meredith and Tony and I, and we can we can sort out where we think we are and we'll bring that those results back to this group uh, to talk about next steps. Uh, and the Bentley has an interesting point here that, you know, you could see one and two working together. If, they, you know, maybe it turns out that those are uh, closely um, ranked as it uh, emerges. So maybe that that makes sense. So we'll just kind of see what the data says and go from there. That sounds good. I, I think we're good with timing. I think we're in a good place in, in terms of we're starting it a little bit earlier than last year so that, you know, we'll have the students at the Sour Building in April um, and then the new students will be announced in May. And I think it's a good opportunity to kind of get them involved before, you know, summer break starts and kind of get them uh, invested in the in the topic. So I think we'll be in good shape with that. So we'll do. I'll throw that. I have my note right here, my little sticky note. I will add that to the exit slip and get that out to you this afternoon. And for those students, that um, are going to tune in later. I'll make sure there's an explanation in the email as well. So great. OK, thanks, everybody. All right, the next item, and I think Dr. Glass, you're going to be up for that one because I just checked in with Brian Perry and he is listening in on House Bill 3 uh, right now. And so the students were wanting a little bit of a legislative update on some edu key education bills um, that have been discussed uh, this General Assembly that may or may not impact them and their schools. So I don't know. I don't really have a list of bills. I didn't know if you wanted to start with one or do you want to maybe ask students first? I'm not. They didn't really specify a certain bill. They just said they'd like to have an update with the session going on right now. Sure. Um, well, uh, it really, I think we need Brian to, Brian to walk us through the individual bills and what they mean. I, I can certainly speak in terms of some general themes that we're seeing. Uh, I had really hoped that this session we would see a focus on supports for the teaching profession, because uh, we know that we've been uh, hearing and now are seeing data around increased turnover and um, lack of qualified applicants. Uh, we now have data that that turnover is higher than what we've seen in the past. It's resulting in um, uh, potentially two to 3,000 more teaching openings than, than we've had in pre previous years. We're seeing uh, school districts solve that uh, gap by relying on emergency certifications at a dramatically increased rate. So we're, we are effectively lowering the bar in terms of qualifications of who we're putting into teaching positions. So um, all, all of those things were distressing. Um, we had a meeting on them this summer where the legislature was interested in hearing about it. We presented some data uh, then. <clears throat> At the beginning of this session, uh, I also presented on it to um, the House Education Committee. Uh, Representative Tipton has introduced a bill uh, designed to uh, provide some uh, supports for the teaching profession. Even I think he would say it's pretty limited in what it does, and then the uh, appropriations associated with it are um, non-existent. So there really isn't. Um, um, it, it, it won't address the problem. It's not at the scale uh, that we we had hoped for. So I, I think um, going into the session, I, I had ho hopes that we would see a focus on this from the legislature. That it doesn't seem to be the case. I spoke to a group of educators this morning, um, and you know, my message to them is I don't think help is on the way. Um, so we're going to have to uh, figure out, uh, you know, how we support each other, how educators support and take care of themselves uh, to stay uh, engaged, invested, um, and and moving forward. Because I, I don't believe that the legislature is interested in in um, coming into this issue, at least not in this legislative session. Uh, what does seem to be the focus of the legislature is sort of, I would call them sort of cultural issues um, related to LGBTQ individuals, people, and students uh, placing sort of restrictions um, on, on them, uh, particular um, to education um, elements around um, transgender pronouns and the guidance that the department has had around that um, and information that we provide uh, around uh, how we recommend that 
uh, school districts support LGBTQ uh, youth and individuals in their communities. Um, so they're very interested in that uh, through the lens of um, what they're calling parent parental rights um, as well. And there are multiple different bills associated with that uh, that are uh, getting at um, parent parental notifications. And some of those we think are good things. Uh, so, for example, if there are medical procedures or mental health procedures, uh, not procedure, but a, a consultation that's taking place, that the parent has provided notice of that, uh, we think that's probably a good thing. Um, one of these bills has uh, specific protections around um, around um, <clears throat> making sure that LGBTQ uh, individuals and concepts um, that are historical in nature are, are part of the curriculum. We think that's probably a good thing. Um, so, but the, then there's a whole host of other sort of uh, things that um, uh, are aimed at sort of limiting um, discussions around these things. Um, and I, I won't get into a, go into a lot of detail, but there there is sort of a nexus around parental rights and then restrictions around um, particularly LGBTQ issues. So I, I think, you know, again, from the beginning of the session, my real hope was that we'd see <clears throat> some focus and attention on the issue of our educated workforce and how we can stabilize it and provide supports. That doesn't seem to be the focus. The focus is a lot on uh, cultural issues and um, and uh, uh, some, some vein or some form of uh, parental uh, rights, uh, although I would argue that some of these bills are actually taking rights away from parents um, in, in some cases. So um, we are also seeing, as um, Dr. Woods Tucker has put into the chat here, there's a bill that's being advanced around um, uh, teacher um, misconduct, particularly around um, uh, teacher sexual misconduct uh, with students and uh, making it uh, more difficult for s someone to engage in that kind of behavior and then change districts uh, before an investigation is completed and some action is taken. So there's um, Representative Tipton has also had a bill that he's put in really in response to uh, what I think was a series from the uh, Herald leader on this issue to make it more difficult for that sort of bouncing around uh, to occur. So when, when one of these issues takes place, there's a, a documentation of it, there's a requirement around disclosing it, um, and uh, it, it, it uh, makes it more difficult for a, a, an individual to sort of move around and, and continue that kind of behavior. So I, we, we're supportive of that bill. The department was involved in uh, helping craft it, so that's out there. Um, so I'll stop there and see what thoughts uh, you may have, and I'm happy to uh, give my perspective or answer any questions that um, are out there. So Dr. Glass, I do see one here um, from Hunter where he was saying, you know, could the students maybe do something to help with this issue of, of teacher turnover? Um, so that's one question here. I, of course, I'll, I'll take an initial stab at it and then the commissioner can weigh in. Obviously, I know you hear from me all the time about, you know, the importance of your experience that you're seeing at your school. Um, if there's, you know, how is it, how is it, is there a teacher shortage at your school and how is it impacting you to really write those thoughts down? Um, and if it's not for an op-ed or something that we can run, it'd be great to, you know, have you share those thoughts with your individual lawmakers or, or other policymakers at the state level so that they can get that perspective as to how this is impacting you. And it's certainly not just a teacher shortage. We know that there's a bus driver shortage and there's a cafeteria worker shortage and, um, pretty much across the education workforce. So any of those things that are impacting you that you are seeing from your lens uh, would really be helpful for us to know so that we can you know, include that in some of the data points or the uh, commentary that we're providing when we're asked to testify or, or to talk about these, these areas. Yeah, and I see some, um, you know, feedback in the chat on on some of the bills that are out there, and uh, I'm distressed by them as well. And uh, I just want to state for the record that the department and I um, are uh, firm in our support of all all of our students, and want to make sure that our, uh, public schools are welcoming and inclusive of uh, every kind uh, of student. And so we've been stead steadfast in that, and will remain so. And then Luke, I saw, are there any materials or guides towards writing an op-ed? And, and really, uh, not really. I mean, it's really just, 
you know, you can certainly start just kind of collecting your thoughts. Um, and, you know, there's folks on my team that can help um, help you with that process. So we can reach out to you about that. Uh, we certainly would love to love to hear from you and, and your your perspective on that. Um, there was another question. Looks like Caleb was asking, and I know we did this earlier. And I remember, I remember probably one of our first meetings of this year, Dr. Darnell had come in and was asking, you know, how many students right now that are part of this advisory council are interested in becoming teachers or joining maybe the educate. I could just take it a step further and, and maybe wanting to join the educator workforce in some capacity. And if, if you are, um, feel free to just type in the chat or raise your hand. And I think that we may see that 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 is part of the area that we need to address. Well, I'm happy to see Bentley is considering that. That's certainly refreshing. Oh, yep, that's I mean, so I think that that right there lies, you know, part of the, you know, trying to get uh, students interested and inspired to maybe perhaps becoming a, a teacher. I think that there's a lot of um, just talking with your own teachers, you can probably find um, some of the challenges that they have or you see them yourself as a, as a student in the classroom. Um, things like, you know, Dr. Glass has talked about, you know, three three main things that he feels um, are you know, kind of the issues that we're looking here at here. And I don't know if he wants to expand any more on that. We can certainly share with you the column that he has had. Um, but it's, this is definitely going to be something that we're going to be facing for many years. Um, so if you have younger siblings and that are going through the school system, this is probably going to be something that impacts them and um, quite possibly your children when you are uh, in, a, in 10 to 15 years when you're um, in this role as an educator or as a business professional. All right, so I think that's it for now. Um, we probably will wrap up right at 11. Um, I just have a couple of more things I wanted to uh, talk with you about, and then we can get everybody. There's actually just two opportunities I wanted to share with you that you are aware of. One of them we've already discussed, and so I want to um, just bring that up real quick. Um, just a reminder again, I mean, we talked about it a lot about the student and the teacher position on the Kentucky Board of Education, which I believe is my next thing. There we are. Um, I will make sure that in your exit slip, you do have the link for the application, but just note that it has to be a current sophomore. So anybody that you know that is a current sophomore that lives in that fifth congressional district is who would be um, eligible to apply. So that is there. I will make sure to include the map too, because I know a lot of you um, are, are clear on some, especially as you get towards the lines. Uh, which congressional district it is. So I just wanted to let you know that that will be coming. And then I also wanted to remind you that during the same time, the um, we are accepting applications for the advisory council. So many of you all, that's why we were kind of curious to see how you heard about the council to begin with. And we will have quite a few spots open. I think it's somewhere around eight, 17 or 18 is what I'm thinking about. Um, that will join us next year because we'll have a number of seniors that will be graduating. And this application process is open to any freshman, sophomore, or junior that is a current freshman, sophomore, or junior that would be interested in joining the advisory council. And we're seeking those from across the state. So, you know, while we do ensure that we do have some diversity across the state geographically and, um, you know, all of that stuff. It is anybody from across the state is welcome to apply if you are a current freshman, sophomore, or junior. And that application period ends on March 9th. So any of you that have friends or, or cousins or, or relatives in other parts of the state that you think would be an amazing addition to this advisory council, just reach out to them and ask them to apply. And if you have any questions on that, just let me know. One other thing I wanted to share with you is uh, a note from the Kentucky Student Voice Team, and they are um, needing some students for research study. Um, and so these are, this slide will be, all of these slides will be prov provided to you, and that they're looking for um, just some additional help with the study that they're doing. Um, all participants will be compensated $25 for their involvement, so a little incentive there for you to consider. 
and um, we have we will have in your exit slip and in your email who you can contact for that information. The next thing on the item is really adjournment. I did want to reemphasize to you guys that we will not have a meeting in March. It was scheduled for March 28th. We are going to cancel that meeting because the meeting in April is going to be on uh, April 11th, which also coincides with the Kentucky Board of Education meeting. And some of you who presented on the safety project will actually be working to present some of that to the Kentucky Board of Education later that day. So that is why we are we are holding that meeting on April 11th. It will be here at the Sauer Building uh, in Frankfurt and you will be receiving more details um, as they become available. We will also be honoring all of our seniors at the April meeting. Uh, they'll be getting their graduation cords and their pins um, so that you have those in time for graduation. Uh, Commissioner, I'll leave the parting last remarks to you and, and we could probably get out a little bit early today. Okay, thanks, Tony. Thanks, everybody. We've uh, really enjoyed our conversation today. Hopefully it's been a value to you. Uh, we'll make sure we follow up on that um, rank ordering in the uh, exit ticket and look forward to working with you on that project going forward.